Happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And this path is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God. But we cannot keep all the commandments without first knowing them, and we cannot expect to know all or more than we now know unless we comply with or keep those we have already received. That which is wrong under one circumstance may be and often is right under another. God said, Thou shalt not kill. At another time he said, Thou shalt utterly destroy. This is the principle on which the government of heaven is conducted, by revelation adapted to the circumstances in which the children of the kingdom are placed. It's going to be about. Okay, so 1842. Joseph Smith arranges a private meeting between himself and Nancy Rigdon, the 19-year-old daughter of Sidney Rigdon. In this meeting, he proposes that he and Nancy Rigdon enter into some sort of illicit relationship. We don't know if this is a concubine or a plural wife or a spiritual wifery, but some sort of proposal of this nature is made. What do you think I am? I told you to leave me alone. Nancy forcefully rejects. Smith makes a proposal to Nancy. She rejects it. He promises to write a letter, and the letter that survives to this day, which is Joseph's argument for how his proposal could be seen as righteousness, um, is found in the pages of the happiness letter, and that's what the rest of this video is about. So without further ado, the happiness letter presentation from 2019 Sunstone in Salt Lake City. All right. So um, if any of you are familiar with the blog, Thoughts on Things and Stuff, or the YouTube channel, Finger of Thoughts, then you'll know that uh, I start with history and then try to dive a little bit deeper and look into the context of some other religious movements and see what we can learn from there and then apply to our analysis of Joseph Smith. Um, I had the benefit of, of Chris's excellent um, historical presentation, so I don't have to go into that as much, but we're going to take a dive into looking at the language of the happiness letter. Exactly. Now we've got a Mormon scholar that's really going to be thorough in his investigation of a Mormon document. He's going to look at the style of the Joseph Smith happiness letter to determine whether that fits and reflects Joseph Smith's actual writing style. You know, that plain spoken Yankee prose versus that over the top florid writing style of say, a Campbellite minister such as Sidney Rigdon himself, who was trained by Alexander Campbell, minister who was educated at the University of Glasgow and was greatly influenced by the Scottish Enlightenment writers including John Locke. You know, John Locke, that Scottish philosopher that was so into the pursuit of happiness thing, that might be one person that influenced happiness letter. But I wonder, did Joseph Smith read John Locke or was it Sidney Rigdon trained by Alexander Campbell who studied at the feet of John Locke? Hmm, let's see, Yankee plain spoken prose versus University of Glasgow, Scottish Enlightenment prose. Hmm. When I look at this letter, I definitely see Sidney Rigdon. But now it looks like we've got a Mormon scholar who's actually going to authenticate a document before he starts to condemn Joseph Smith. Let's take a listen. And reflect on whether or not it matches the pattern that we may find in other religious sexual predators. Now. What? <laughs> Aren't you going to at least authenticate the document, lay some foundation, the threshold rule of evidence required by all courts of law? Oh dear, I guess I'll have to at least authenticate the document for him, and then he can continue with his argument, smearing Joseph Smith as a sexual predator. So far, we don't have Joseph Smith anywhere near this document. We have Willard Richards, who delivered the document to Sidney Rigdon's home, and then we have Sidney Rigdon producing the document out of thin air. That does not constitute foundation. Now, if Willard Richards testified that he saw Joseph Smith write the document, that might be sufficient foundation. But so far, we don't have Willard Richards any place authenticating this document. And I'm going to show you later that Joseph Smith filed an actual lawsuit against these allegations against Chauncey Higby who accused him of seducing Nancy Rigdon. Yes, Joe Smith actually filed a lawsuit for slander based on these allegations of his seduction of Nancy Rigdon. And Chauncey Higby did not include Willard Richards in any of his witnesses. Therefore, the foundation of this document would be questionable. Poor Joseph Smith. 
He never gets a fair break with any of the pro or anti-Mormon scholars. They both accuse him of sexual improprieties. And no one's there to defend poor Joseph Smith. So, for example, this scholar just happened to say that Joseph Smith admitted everything to Nancy Rigdon and Sidney Rigdon when he was confronted with this happiness letter. Wrong. Joseph Smith filed a lawsuit in response, forcing them to court to prove any of these salacious and false allegations. For argument's sake, let's say that Willard Richards tells the court, yes, I saw Joseph Smith write that document. That then would shift the burden to Joseph Smith sufficiently for Joseph Smith to then deny it. And we know that Joseph Smith is going to deny it because he denied all the allegations of the spiritual wifery alleged against him. So you as a juror have to decide, well, does that look like Joseph Smith's writing? Does it sound like Joseph Smith? First, the writing style of this letter does not match Joseph Smith's writing style. And how do we know that? Well, there is a scholar that have analyzed Joseph Smith's writing style. According to this expert, Eleanor Partridge is a straightforward Yankee style prose. Eleanor Partridge, who has studied the writing style of Joseph Smith by comparing his letters to other people's writing styles, such as Sidney Rigdon, and she's doing this analyzing Joseph Smith reported lectures on faith. She concludes that Joseph Smith did not write the lectures on faith as purported by the Utah Mormon Church, but in fact, most of it reflects Sidney Rigdon's style, and as others later have concluded, it was written. Joseph Smith's lectures on faith was written by committee, as we're going to eventually discover. My belief is that all the documents attributed to Joseph Smith were rewritten, edited, and completely changed by the Utah Mormon Church, so it no longer reflects anything that Joseph Smith intended, but that these documents were written by a committee to doctor them or to make them fit the new order of things, as one Mormon scholar had put it, after Brigham Young in the Journal of Discourses admits that the minute that Joseph Smith was assassinated, he commenced to revise the history of the church, the history of Joseph Smith. Now, mind you, in this particular case, the Utah church got caught phoning up Joseph Smith's lectures on faith. It was only after this particular scholar, Eleanor Partridge, discovered that the writing style did not reflect anything of Joseph Smith. The Utah Mormon church pulled the lectures on faith and said, oh, well, yes, it was probably written by a committee, but it was overseen by Joseph Smith. So that the Mormon church has a custom and practice of just doctoring these documents and attributing them to Joseph Smith. And we're going to find out that the prose style of the happiness letter is so foreign to Joseph Smith, plain spoken Yankee prose, that it now is just laughable to consider that it was even written by Joseph Smith. Again, Eleanor Partridge's conclusions are, Joseph Smith wrote as he spoke, in a style more familiar than formal, not this over-the-top, florid style that you would expect from a University of Glasgow educated writer, such as Alexander Campbell, who trained Sidney Rigdon in all the elegant oration of a Scottish trained minister. Happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. But we cannot keep all the commandments without first knowing them, and we cannot expect to know all or more than we now know unless we comply with or keep those we have already received. Wow, that's a lot of prepositions and dependent verbal clauses. Hardly the plain spoken verbal writing style of Joseph Smith, as the scholars have identified. No, this reflects the writing style of Alexander Campbell and Sidney Rigdon. I'll leave a link to Alexander Campbell's writing, and you can go through it and see if you fall asleep after the first paragraph, which is actually one sentence, but equals a paragraph. Fuck. So what did the pursuit of happiness mean as defined by the Scottish Enlightenment? 
Well, I think you'd be quite surprised. Have you ever wondered why the Quorum of the Twelve that embraced polygamy, promoted polygamy, and practice, and in fact, give people who didn't practice polygamy, got their ideas from? Well, it was from the pursuit of happiness. John Locke and Alexander Campbell. So I took some time to review Alexander Campbell's lectures on Christianity. Yes, I sacrificed several nights reading through this ponderous lectures of Alexander Campbell to distill exactly what Alexander Campbell was saying. And what Alexander Campbell was saying and Charles Finney, these revivalist ministers, was basically Calvinism with a twist. It was free love. In other words, whatever isn't in the Bible is not only permitted, but mandatory. And what they claim is the Bible doesn't say anything about marriage or the relationships between men and women. Therefore, those relationships can be and must be pursued as a goal of happiness. Hence, the free love, the free polygamy, the free spiritual wifery, whatever inner relationships anybody wants to pursue in pursuit of their happiness, that is the highest and best good. No joke, I'll go through it with you. If Sidney Rigdon wrote half of what they claimed Joseph Smith wrote, he truly was a brilliant man. Crazy, but brilliant. His brother even stated that Sidney Rigdon got hit on the head when he was young and was never quite sane since that time. A little bit off, a little bit in balance, but a wonderful orator you cannot take away from him. And I do believe that Sidney Rigdon did have a talent for distilling some of the more dense enlightenment thinking into a more comprehensible uh, uh, treatise of happiness. So I'm just going to give you a, a feel of what these other ministers were writing and talking like. It is so laborious, so dense, so turgid, so unbelievably complex that nobody could understand it. But I guess you would get swung up into the emotional rapture that would happen during one of these revivals that some of this kind of godly goop made sense. But I'm going to show you Charles Finney was also writing about happiness. These revivals certainly had at their foundation sexual revivalism, sensation, and freedom. It wasn't all good little Christianity, let's be all chaste and let's live alone in a, a convent. No, this was full-blown Sex, sensuality done as a religious rite. And Sidney Rigdon was one of the best. And it's my belief that Joseph Smith infiltrated the Sidney Rigdons, the Alexander Campbells, uh, the Charles Finneys, who were in Ohio at the time, Oberlin, um, Ohio. Oberlin College was ground zero for these preachers that were preaching this wild kind of ecstatic uh, religions and wild sexual orgiastic uh, sensations would happen. And Joseph Smith, I think, was a agent of the United States infiltrating these kind of crazy quorum of the 12, let's do polygamy, and basically trying to push them out west. He brought civilization to the western territories and at the same time pushed out the crazies into farther west, which was ultimately the goal of the United States, which was to go west to the Pacific. And they got the more fringy kind of people, such as the Quorum of the Twelve, um, these ecstatic creatures, to go along with the program. Because, number one, they got paid to do it. And, number two, uh, they could really lead the crowds. But I'm going to end this video now. And we'll follow up with the lawsuit that Joseph Smith filed with some extremely interesting research on Joseph Smith and defending him against the allegations of polygamy. This 
research that I'm going to be highlighting is important research done by some very dedicated researchers. And every person who is interested in Mormon history should read this research and then gauge their opinion based on all the evidence, not just one-sided evidence that we have been spoon-fed by Mormon scholars who have agendas. Anyway, all research should be reviewed and then you can make your own decision on what the truth is. And the truth is always more complicated and more interesting than what you have been led to believe.